I'd like to welcome you back to our series on literal Genesis, where again, we strive to hold firm to Scripture and hold loose to theories. And in particularly, this, this theory of, of evolution, this macro evolution of how rocks and dirts can become uh, people and humans and basketball players over eons of time. Uh, this is the part where we want to hold loosely to because, uh, number one, uh, it's the, the Bible doesn't say that's how God brought things about. And we, we talked about this in previous lessons. It's a very cruel way to bring about life, not to, in all in, within God's character. And secondly, these theories change all the time. And as we learn more and more about uh, life and what life is, uh, life is one of those things that's hard to define. Uh, there's, there's two or three things in the world of science where you ask someone to define and it's going to be very, very hard for them to come up with an explanation. Life is one of them. We'll look at another one here in just a moment. So we want to hold loosely to those theories. We don't want to hold on so tightly to those and, and compromise Scripture. We've seen in previous sessions that that just leads to a bunch of theological inconsistencies. So, but today, what I want to do is take uh, go a little bit deeper. So, you know, last session we, we looked at four dimensions of, of the genome. You know, and how it folds itself and, and puts the instructions close together that needs to be and how it uh, does alternative splicing, if you remember. It's just absolutely amazing. And how th those have all the hallmarks of intelligent design to take a finite amount of space and to have so much information in there. How do you efficiently access that information? Um, it's absolutely jaw-dropping. Now today, we want to talk about energy. Energy is kind of like... The word life. If you ask a physicist, for example, uh, how would you define energy? It's, it's, well, you can get a definition of what it does uh, and maybe how it works, but what is it? What, what is the essence of energy? Nobody knows. Uh, same thing for life. Right? What is life? Well, you can kind of get a definition of life, but what, what exactly is it? Um, it's just one of those things that's really, really hard to pin down. But we're going to look at um, you know, how, how we generate energy within our cells. Can't do anything without energy. In fact, energy, here's the definition, is the ability to bring about change or to do work. Very, very simple, right? So think about not how the, that those initial rocks and mud turned into to biogenesis, right? To turn into some kind of living thing, but we're gonna start with the living thing. Uh, I don't think rocks and mud do turn into living things. But uh, that's, that's another, another session, maybe. But once you have that living thing, that first cell, that single cell that's got DNA, it's fully functioning, reproduce itself, can take nutrients in from its environment, how does that cell change over time to become plants and, and animals and insects and uh, all the way up to humans? How does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen without energy. Nothing happens without energy. If you're going to have anything happen at all, you need energy. So that's why I want to kind of focus in on, on this idea of energy. In fact, no living or manufactured thing exists on the planet without energy. Try to think of one example of any manufactured thing or living thing that doesn't require energy. You, you got to have energy. Now, you may have heard of this, uh, this phrase, no free lunches. When I talk to, um, to younger uh, generations sometimes, I'll ask them if they know what this means and I, I get a lot of blank looks. I guess it's one of those phrases that may have kind of fallen out of our, our vernacular. But um, no free lunches means nothing in life is, is really free, right? And, and particularly when we're talking about this idea of energy. Um, where does energy come from and at what expense? Because energy is, can't be free. Where does a single cell get its energy for all those innumerable steps that it must have gone through, if evolution is true, to change from a single cell into a human being? And all of that has to happen with energy at, at every step. So no free lunches. We're going to investigate where this energy comes from and get a little better idea. Now today, I love this part. This is, this is my best part, right? Uh, food. Uh, who doesn't like to eat food? And as humans, we can take in meat and potatoes and, and turn that into energy. In fact, nearly everything that we eat eventually winds up as glucose. Almost everything we eat is kind of amazing. And our body is able to take that glucose and, and transform it somehow into a form that the cell can actually use for energy. That's the part I want to focus in on today. In fact, cells, they take that glucose from those meat and potatoes and they 
turn it into ATP. Now that stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's just, it's a long name for a chemical, a very small chemical. And to the right here, you can kind of see this uh, adenosine triphosphate here. Uh, particularly, you can look at the three structures kind of hanging off to the left. That's the tri part. Tri means three. These are three phosphate molecules. Okay, well, how does the cell take ATP and, and use it for energy, kind of like we would uh, for gas in an automobile? Well, at a very high level, whenever you have three of these, these phosphates together, it's like having three kids in a room where two of them get along really, really well, but nobody likes that third kid, right? Because, uh, I don't know, maybe they're a bully or something like that. Well, same thing here with these three phosphates. This last phosphate wants to, wants to go, wants to be free. So think of it like a, a spring that you compress down. And in that spring's compression state, that's the three phosphates. And so when this third phosphate is broken off, it finally gets to be free, the spring can, can unload and move into a relaxed state. And that process of unspringing, right, becoming uncompressed, that produces energy. That's very, very similar to what happens here in the cell. The cell is able to cleave or to break off this phosphate here, this third phosphate, and it produces energy in the process. And the cell is able to harness that energy. So when we're talking about ATP, adenosine triphosphate, this is what we're talking about. And it all starts here with this marvelous process of food and taste buds and have you ever thought about that? You know, why did God give us taste buds? It's not necessary. We could have taken in meat and potatoes and, and not having any enjoyment out of that at all, but, but we do. It's a very, very uh, pleasurable thing to, uh, to experience food. Okay, enough about food. So what engine, what motor inside of the cells that, that, does, that creates this ATP, right? Now, in like in life, we know that uh, gasoline, you know, runs our automobiles. If we trace it back to its source, well, that's from um, uh, fossil fuels, right? We mine them out of the earth, we refine them, and turn, make gasoline, put it in our cars, and we go. Well, this is the motor. This is the thing. It's called ATP synthase, and it is, is a molecular motor. Now, just like the motor we looked at on the bacterial flagellum that powered its tail to give it movement, uh, this also has stators and rotors, right, in this engine. Uh, there are parts that are stationary, there are parts that rotate. And if you look at the, the kind of the orange and gray matrix here, um, this motor is embedded in the lining of, of what we call mitochondria. So this is a, it's kind of a tiny little organ inside of our cells. There's lots of these inside of our cells. And inside of this mitochondria, think of mitochondria like a, like a factory, not a factory, but a, a power plant. And mitochondria, one of its job is to produce power for all of the cells, for the rest of the cells. And so inside of mitochondria is kind of double walled. So you have an outer wall and you have an inner wall. And inside of this inner wall, this motor is kind of split between both sides of this wall the way this, this motor is situated in the, uh, the matrix. And what powers this motor are protons. And we'll, we'll look at this more in detail here in a moment, but these protons that are inside of this, this inter matrix, they, they want to go to the other side. Why do they want to go to the other side? I feel like there's a, a joke here somewhere, like the chicken across the road. It's no joke. There's protons on both sides of this membrane. And whenever you have a discrepancy in the amount of protons on one side or the other, the protons naturally want to uh, go to equilibrium. They want to even it out on both sides. So if you have a lot of protons uh, down here and less up here, they want to go to the other side. Uh, that's just how things work in chemistry usually. And so when protons enter this tunnel into this motor, this is what drives the motor, turns the motor. Okay, so far so good. Uh, these protons are very, very tiny, right? We're talking exquisitely small architecture. And when this motor is turned, what it's doing is it's taking these two chemicals and it's mashing them together to produce ATP. This ADP is adenosine diphosphate. Don't worry, there's not going to be a test after this, right? But di means two, right? So it's, it's taking two 
Remember we talked about ATP has three of those phosphates? Well, ADP only has two, so it's taking the extra phosphate here, and inside of this, this part of the motor, it kind of mashes them together, compresses that spring, okay? And then what's produced is ATP. Now, there are thousands of these inside of the mitochondria, inside of all of our trillions of cells. So imagine all the ATP that's being produced right now. Even if you're sitting perfectly still, you're thinking. ATP is used in that electrical process, right, that fires our synapse. It's used to move our muscles. It's used to, to, to walk. Uh, it's used for all of the activities that goes on inside the cell. We'll look at this in a future session, but the cell is like a city. It's got roads and highways and post offices and waste management and workers and all these things require energy every single step. No free lunches. Everything requires energy inside the cell. And so you've got thousands of these producing this ATP. In fact, one cell out of your trillion holds about a billion ATP molecules. That's a lot of gas cans, okay? Now this, this motor is extremely efficient. Now when I talk about motors and efficiency, it may help to compare this to uh, what's the most efficient automobile engine that we have today. That is the, I believe it's the Mercedes AMG Formula One, where it's got an efficiency of 50%, meaning 50% of the power is actually goes into the, to the car and 50% is lost. It dissipates as heat. Engines get hot. So it's, it's 50%, and that's the best that we have in an automobile. This motor is nearly 100% efficient. We don't know how to make things like that. 100% efficiency. In fact, every one turn of this motor produces three of our ATP gas cans. Every one turn produces three ATPs, powered by a tiny, tiny little, little proton, proton molecules. And as I mentioned before, each of our cells can contain one billion of these ATP modules. We're talking very, very microscopic here. And if you were to weigh one single ATP molecule, it would be, it would be the decimal, 0.000, it would be so small, it would weigh next to nothing. Yet your body produces so much of these that it equals your weight every single day. So in a 24 hour period, let's say you weighed 150 pounds, you're producing 150 pounds of ATP. Now wait, Kim, are you trying to tell me at some point in a day I weigh 300 pounds if I'm normally 150? Uh, no, it doesn't work like that. These gas cans are being emptied almost as soon as they're made. So you don't, you don't feel the extra weight. Okay, we're, we're good there, right? However, something very interesting about ATP is we can manufacture this ourselves. In the lab, we can take a, a denison, um, we can take the molecules, we can, we can mash them together. But if we were to do that, it would actually cost us around $1.4 million every single day for one person. If you were to make this in yourself, in the lab, it would cost you about $1.4 million. Yet your body does this on meat and potatoes. We should be very thankful we have this process. Okay, I want to take a little closer look at, at what leads up to this, this motor, right? So we kind of got a, a basic understanding of how the motor works. Now again, thinking about our two alternatives. Either this is designed by an intelligent creator, or this somehow assembled itself completely by accident over eons of time by that blind three-year-old making changes to the manual. I don't know about you, I'm going with the intelligent designer, right? Just because I'm a Christian, I've said this before, doesn't mean I'm going to check my brain at the front door uh, when it comes to science. That makes no sense to me. That's not experiential. That's not evidential. Uh, this has all the hallmarks of intelligent design. There's specified complexity here. Things like this don't build themselves uh, by accident and random chances. Now, there, there's several chains here that happened before this that I want to go into to, to kind of give you a little bit of a bigger picture. Now, actually, there's a much bigger picture that starts with the meat and potatoes and digestion and goes through all that and the enzymes unlocking the calories and all the, all the things that have to be transported just to get to what I'm about to show you. But what I'm about to show you is still pretty, pretty crazy. So this is gonna, this is gonna animate here in just a moment. And so let me kind of explain what's going on here. You'll, you'll see these larger molecules 
right? There's, there's actually four of them, one, two, three, four. The fourth one here being the ATP synthase. That's the motor that produces the ATP gas cans, if you will. These, these other molecules here, these are acting like pumps. Okay, what, what, are they, what are they pumping? Well, remember the protons that I was talking about that actually flow in here that run this motor? These protons are pumped from one side of the membrane to the other. So you need these pumps in order for this to work because you need the protons to be able to flow into the motor. If all the protons are down here, it doesn't work. We have no energy, we, we, there's no life. Somehow you gotta get the protons on the other side of the wall and that's what these pumps do. Now, how are these pumps powered? If this is making ATP, what powers these pumps? You're gonna find this hard to believe, electrons. As those meat and potatoes get digested and broken down, there are little carriers you're gonna see in the animation in a moment that come in here and carrying these, these electrons broken down from the food process. Um, they're gonna donate an electron to these pumps and that's what powers the pumps. We're gonna look at that in a little bit more detail on the next slide, but just, just what I want you to pay attention to is the shuttling of these electrons. This pump will use it, it'll shuttle, It'll come over here, this pump will use it, it'll shuttle, this pump will use it, and at the last side here, when this pump is, is done pumping the protons across the gradient, it needs to get rid of its electron, and it actually combines with some, some oxygen molecules to create two molecules of water. This is the whole reason we breathe, right here. This electron has to attach to something at the end of this process or it doesn't work. Oxygen needs to be there. This is why it's important to breathe. We all know it's important to breathe, but this is why, right? This oxygen molecule makes its way here so that it can take that electron when it's finished and, uh, and create water out of the process. Now these, these two shuttle enzymes here, um, this ubiquinone, oh, by the way, this is another name for um, uh, CoQ10. Does that sound familiar? If your doctor has, has prescribed you coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10 and you're wondering, what does it do? Oh, pay attention. This is what CoQ10 does. Its job is to shuttle electrons, right, between these pumps. Very, very important. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the animation and I may kind of point some things out as we, we go along here. But uh, this is called the electron transport chain. And you'll see why. Because it's, it's literally using these electrons and then kicking them over to the next piece until it gets to the end. And now that once you have all the protons, or not all of them, but a lot of them up here, guess what? Now they want to go back. They want to go back across the wall because now you have a concentration of, of the protons up here. And this is the only way they can get to the other side. And as they're going through ATP synthase, they power it and it creates ATP. Okay, we'll play the... Uh, Play the video here and you'll notice these helper enzymes coming here on the side here in a moment. Uh, they're going to donate their electrons to this pump. Then there's CoQ10 moving it to the next pump. There's cytochrome C moving it to the next pump. You'll notice these protons moving from the bottom to the top. There's our three pumps working. Now the protons want to come back to the other side. They got to go through the ATP synthase enzyme or, or engine. And that's where ATP is made. That's where the fuel is made. Okay? Stop for just a second. Take a pause. This is a tiny part of the process of meat and potatoes finally getting down to a single electrons, running this electron chain, and then powering the ATP synthase motor. Can you imagine, no matter how much time you have, that this process could build itself. Now I know I've, I've talked to, to biochemists before and, and yeah, they're, you know, these things are attracted, and those things are attracted and, and I understand how basic chemistry works, but we're not talking just basic chemistry. We're talking about a system that works together. And where do these things come from? We're gonna look at that here in a couple of slides. All this is so intricately tied together and tied back to DNA and tied to energy and tied to enzymes that it's, there's no way this process could come about step by step. I, it, first of all, it's never been shown. You can't show it, right? There's no paper that shows that this can even be done. But this, again, has all of the hallmarks of intelligent designs. A mind designed this system. That's the best possible explanation.
That's my opinion, of course. This is the same process, only kind of laid out in a two-dimensional diagram. We're not going to go through this. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't a chemistry class or biochemistry or anything like that, but you kind of see the, the pumps that we we're talking about here, then the ATP synthase, and all the things that have to be just right. And by the way, things like pH, we haven't even talked about pH in the cell. The, uh, everything has to be just right for all this to work and for this to be transferred from one station to the next, these pumps that pump those, those protons from one side of the gradient to the other. Um, <clears throat> it looks complicated. It, it's not as complicated as it may seem here, but the idea is this could happen. A blind three-year-old could build something like this over time. Come on. I don't think so. Now, one of the parts I'm going to hone in on is what we call these redox centers. Now, this is a pump. This, this uh, ominous uh, dark structure here uh, is one of those proton pumps. And when these electrons are shuttled over to the pump, here's what actually happens inside of that pump. These electrons kind of bounce back and forth off of these centers. So the electrons are the, are the light blue, and these, these redox centers are purple. And the electrons want to move from higher to lower because it has to do with the affinity of, of, of uh, chemical properties inside of the pump. We don't need to go there. Just know that the electrons want to go here. They want to go here, right? And every time they make this hop into one of these, these little these mitts that catch them, these are redox centers, there's a little bit of energy released from this electron. So energy, 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 energy. We have seven, seven drops here, so seven energy drops. And all that energy is harnessed by this pump and used at the same time once it has enough energy to guess what? Pump protons across the gradient. This is so intricate. Think about how small an electron is. Think about if this process didn't work or if, or if there weren't enough of these redox centers to capture all the energy because every time it's, it's captured, it releases energy. Well, what if the electron skipped these steps? You, would, you wouldn't have enough energy. You wouldn't have energy to power the pump. You couldn't get the protons across the gradient. Then you wouldn't have any way of powering the ATP synthase. It's all so delicately tied together. It's just unfathomable to believe that this could be the process of a blind chance. This is a system. I'm an engineer. Anything that I engineer is not based on chance. Believe me, it's, it's very, very uh, thought out. All right, how small are we talking about this ATP synthase? If we, if we look at a dime and look at the edge of a dime, it's uh, typically about one millimeter. So we ask the question, how many of these ATP synthase motors can we stack on the edge of this dime, going from the bottom to the top? The answer is about 100,000 of these engines. This is the level of smallness that we're talking about. 100,000 of these motors can fit in about a millimeter stacked one on top of the other. We can't create technology like this. Now you may be thinking, whoa, wait a minute, what about microprocessors? There's billions of transition, uh, transistors in a, in a very, very small space. That's transistors. This is a motor, a working motor with moving parts. We don't know how to create things like this. But somehow nature figured out how to do it by accident at this scale over eons of time. Again, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, even the most simplest, and I put that in quotes, single cell, because if it's a cell and it's, it's alive, it's not simple. There's nothing simple about, about life at all. But even the most simplest cell runs off of ATP and requires this process. Now, remember like kind of the last session or session before we talked about the MO1 bacterium uh, with all of its tails? and how supposedly they found that in rock that was three billion years old. The Cambrian explosion, if you remember that from your science class, was like 500, 550 million years ago. I don't believe in the time scales, but if you believe in evolution, you believe in that ideology, that's, that's fine, right? Uh, I'll still, still like you after the class, that's okay. But now you gotta go back three billion years and you've got this process in place. This complex ATP synthase process with these tiny, tiny molecular motors running off of electrons and protons. How did that get there that far back? Every living thing requires it. Now here's where someone might say, well, life back then was simpler. It had simpler ways of, of, of uh, 
of making energy for itself. It doesn't, this, this was evolved over billions of years of time. Well, that just creates other questions in my mind. If these first living cells were simple and operated off a of simple, simple machinery, where the machines come from, that's another question, but let's say that happened and some of those cells evolved into plants and reptiles and mammals and, and man over time, are you telling me that simultaneously across all these living things, they all developed ATP synthase individually? That, that's even more improbable than the first single cell having it to begin with. Lots of problems. And by the way, the instructions for building these, these components, this motor, guess where they are? They're in the DNA. I want to ask this question. This is a very important question. Let's just start with the ATP synthase motor, this tiny, tiny little motor. Fit 100,000 of these end to end on the, on the edge of a dime. This is, this is a motor, another way of looking at it, right, with our, our rotors and stators and the uh, ADP making ATP, the protons going through it, kind of powering the pump. So nothing happens without energy. We said that. There's no free lunches. If a single cell is going to evolve somehow over millions, billions of years, whatever it is, then you need energy along every step of the way. This is how living things get their energy. Now, the instructions for making this is in the DNA. Who builds this motor in early life? Where do they find the instructions? Well, they find the instructions in the DNA. So we have the motor. We have the instructions for the motor. Everybody clear on that so far? All right? Have motor, the instructions for the motor. Well, obviously, we need someone to read the instructions to build the motor. The instructions for the motor are in the DNA. The workers can read the DNA and build the, the motor. Makes sense. We, we, we need these parts. Kind of like having all those manuals of the airplane uh, in our hangar and having no one to, to read it or skilled enough to know how to build from it. Uh, same thing in DNA. You need those workers. Enzymes can read the DNA and they can send the, um, the instructions to factories and factories can build the parts. That's how it works in the cell. The instructions for building the enzymes are also in the DNA. Now you may be a little confused at this point. I hope so, because this is confusing. Oh, and by the way, we have a repair worker that repairs the DNA as errors happen. Remember we talked about in previous session how one quintillion errors accumulate in our cell, not accumulate, they happen in our cells every day through this copying process. And if it weren't for these workers repairing those errors, we wouldn't live very long. Very, very essential. Oh, by the way, the instructions for building these workers are in the DNA. Let's see if I can get this straight. Enzymes build the workers based off of the blueprint in the DNA. They build the repairmen based off of instructions in the DNA. The instructions for the enzymes are in the DNA. Enzymes must build themselves using instructions in the DNA. Nothing happens without energy. We need to build these motors whose instructions are in the DNA that must be followed by the enzymes. Well, let me ask this, this critical thinking question. Which of these came first in the evolutionary ideology? This is not a question you can just sweep under the rug. I've talked to many people who hold very, very strongly, educated people, some scientists, and you just can't say, well, things spontaneously arose in the cell. How, how did this happen? How did this system come together when every one of these parts are needed at the beginning, from the very beginning? Without repair, nothing would last very long at all because of the copy errors. Without workers, nobody would be able to read the DNA. And without energy, nothing happens with the inside of a cell. How do you get all these things right there at the beginning from the very first living cell? Well, I, I have an answer for that. God spoke, and it was. This is a product of an intelligent mind. Again, science, when you carry it out, does not lead to a disbelief in God. Not at all. But the more knowledge we have of the cell, the deeper we go, the more things that we learn, it's just absolutely fascinating. And I've said it before, those goalposts of that evolutionary ideology, they just go so far out. They just keep getting pushed back and pushed back. We're never going to get there with that ideology. And by the way, I'm not the only one who, who thinks that. 
there are different theories. Well, there are always different theories. But we always talk about this neo-Darwinian theory, you know, this macroevolutionary theory, molecules to man type theory. Uh, that's kind of Darwin-based, but, but it's neo. It's new. It's been modified. We've added to it. And we think, well, that must be the answer. That must be the way things happened. But did you know there's other ideas as to how life came about? It's, it's kind of all built on Darwinism a little bit, but, but a little bit different. Why have these other theories if this theory is so good and it works? Well, it doesn't. And that's why there's all these alternative theories. Science does not lead to a disbelief in God, but rather disbelief in atheism. There has to be an intelligent mind. Now, you want to go the, the, the alien, you know, rocket ship hypothesis? That's, that's okay. I right? uh, won't necessarily hold that against you, but be a critical thinker. Ask the tough questions. Where did that life form come from? What are they made of? What's the evidence that that, that even happened? Um, and back to our anchor verse, Psalms 139, 14. I will give thanks to you, to God. Why? For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We watched a very, very short snippet, an animated video of these electrons being passed back and forth by these enzymes, powering these pumps that eventually leads to manufacturing of ATP in the cell. That is amazing. David had, I'm assuming, David had no idea when he wrote this uh, that that's what was going on inside of his cell. And he goes on to say, Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Again, wonderful are your works. And the, the, personally for me, it is so gratifying. The more I, I study biology and look in the cell and all the things that go on on a daily basis happening right now as we're in this room, it just absolutely boggles the mind. Personally, I'll give credit to my Creator that wonderful are His works. He has designed this. And then we're going to close with this, this scripture here, Matthew 11, 28, 29, where Jesus is speaking. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's not my capitalization. That just happens to be a New American Standard uh, version, but that's, that was capitalized in the version. And that's actually the piece that I want to focus on. You will find rest for your souls. You know, it's great that we can get energy from meat and potatoes uh, or choose the diet, what, the diet of your choice, right? You're going to get energy from those nutrients. It's an enjoyable thing to sit down and eat a meal. And for this ATP process to be happening as we eat, uh, it's absolutely amazing. But at times we get tired, don't we? We get tired and we have to rest. And God engineered us to take rest. Uh, it's not all about eating all the time and moving 24-7, right? We have to take our rest. And sometimes we just we need a vacation. we got to get away from it all, right? We're thinking too much and we just need to, to relax the mind. And those are good things. All these are good things. But Jesus is offering us something here that ATP synthase can't satisfy. What is that? That is rest for your souls. And when He says, Come to Me, all ye who are weary and, and burdened, Right? He's talking about a life of service, service to Him. Not one that's hard and, 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 and weighed, weighed you down like that of the, uh, the leaders of His day, the religious leaders, but a way that, uh, again, can renew you, give you rest in a way that ATP can't. And this would be my wish for everyone that I talk to, that they would, would find their Creator, they would seek their Creator out and serve Him. Uh, rather than devote themselves to a life of an ideology that just simply makes no sense and for there's a lack of, of evidence supporting it. So that's going to wrap up this session today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, in our next uh, session, we will we'll look at the second half of this equation. So, so far we've kind of been talking about DNA and the, the, the things that could go wrong, the mutations part of, of evolution. The second part of that is natural selection. Well, what is that? How does that play into that? And how does that affect the, the evolutionary engine? Does it help? Does it hurt? Uh, stay tuned for next session and we'll find out. Thank you.